Well, and welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. And here we are, Wes. It is uh, exciting to get kind of rolling, just putting out some good quality content. The new year is rolling strong in 2023. We're busy. It's crazy, but it's good crazy. (laughs) I don't know, man. Any more every day something else is just around the horizon i mean one day you're like man these people are solid you know and then the next time you show up you know people aren't solid as they used to be i'm just gonna say it i mean from a standpoint of employees and and all that stuff you know as well i know that this is a very interesting time as people are i mean i had somebody turn in their notice they bought a house probably 25 minutes away from my office Right. Hmm. And we hired this girl back probably a year and a half ago. And I mean, I wish her the best. Right. But she pretty much put in her notice because she's scared about making it to work on time. You know, we typically have a Hmm. morning meeting around 730. And I mean, I get it. Her son gets picked up from the bus at 710. She can't get to the meeting on time. It's just always stressful for her. So I overheard her say right in this in the break room the other day that she has this job in another dental office lined up she doesn't even know if she's going to like it right she basically you know like i've read like them people talking about in corporate like google and and microsoft and these bigger companies apple computer even people are leaving their job not knowing if they for sure have another job yet lined up or that they're even yep. going to like it. Not, she said, I don't even know if I'm going to stay at this place that I'm going to. Yep. And it's just an interesting time, right? And, yeah, uh, it's a weird world with stuff like that because you, you, know, you, you have a situation where people are just, since about 2020, 2021, people are just kind of unsettled. You know, they're trying to figure out where they belong, what's important. There's this mentality of the grass is greener, Mm -hmm. um, but that is always the case no matter what. It's just, I think, been amplified in the last year especially. But we've been hearing these situations now where, you know, there was the great resignation of 2021. They talked about that, you know, Mm -hmm. because people were like ready to do something new COVID shook up a lot of people's lives. They're like, okay, I'm going to figure out what's, what I, what, what, where should I be? I need to switch it. I want to change something up. I want to change it up because we need to live our lives now. And some of that's good, but now it's interesting to hear some people coming back like, oh, I actually had a good situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we're going to see in some of that from an employment standpoint, I I think it's going to, obviously we know that the job market is tight. And I think that will probably continue for a while. But I do think the people that, that have this perception that the grass is greener, sometimes will realize it may not be quite what they thought. And in the end, when you finish working one day, you want to look back and say, you know, you want to be proud of what you did, what you accomplished. Mm-hmm. Did you try to be the best? And I think that's that's a hard thing, though, when you're a young person, especially you got to figure that out. You got to figure that out. Right. I mean, you, you always strive to try to have a culture where people want to stay. Right. Mm. And, you know, you create this culture where people you feel like could be a long term employee and you just start looking at what long term means now. Right. And I just don't know that the definition of long term term employee is as long as I want it to be. Right. Mm, Um, mm. And so, you know, the old adage is that we're always hiring. I mean, even more now, right. We're always hiring. We're always looking for great people. And you and I've always talked about this, like in, in situations where we meet a waitress or we meet somebody at a grocery store and actually yep. we hand them a business card. The best people, I've always said it, and I know you have too, and we've heard some of the great speakers even say it. The best employee that you've ever hired is one that already has a job. And so yep. I encourage like those that are listening to this right now, be as bold to carry your business card with you if you still do that. And 
and hand it to somebody and say, hey, if you're looking for a new opportunity, right, I appreciate how you've treated me today, and I'm looking for people just like you. I think that's one of the tips that John and I have actually done that. Most oh, yeah. of my employees that have been, quote, unquote, long-term employees, some of my best employees have already, they quit a job to come to work for me. And uh, yeah. my all of my team leads, all of my team leads on my team uh, started in another place and left that place to work for me. And and that that's kind of a sense of pride, too, is that, you know, I pride ourselves on finding great people that already work somewhere else. I'm offering an opportunity for somebody to better themselves. Now, I told I told a receptionist this the other day in a review and look what it got me. OK, and we'll stick with this little monologue here for a little bit and get right into the show. where We talk about my experiences in building a building. But I was in a review the other day and um, it, we do reviews twice a year. Right. My manager does a great job of, you know, starting with questions and all these things. And, mm -hmm. you know, it got to the point to where we were kind of going through her review and she's a scheduling coordinator in our office and had worked for us for just at a year and had been through our transition into our new building. And she was just a gem. And actually, we got her from another employer in healthcare, not a dentist, but a, another employer. And she stepped right in and did the job very well. And so, and I said, you know, Acacia, I said, you know, my greatest, the greatest thing that would happen for me is for you to graduate, right? And I want you to understand something is that this idea of you being a scheduling coordinator is really kind of an end job for this position. I said, you would have to have other credentials like a hygienist or an assistant to move on or move into a different position. You would need other, other certificates. I said, so you know what I look for you because you're an intelligent person is I look for you to graduate and it wouldn't please me. It would, you couldn't please me more to graduate into something where you're bettering yourself. So if I had the opportunity mm. of helping you get better as a person and achieve your goals, I was like, that would, that would, that would be amazing. So that would be a great way, right. To compliment me. So it turns yeah. out, right. That put her over the edge because she came in the following Monday and turned her two weeks in and said, Hey, I was listening to Dr. Mullins talk a little bit about, and it just, she's like, I've been thinking about it. And my previous oh. employer called me and had, had said over Christmas break that they would hire me back at this extreme dollar amount and help me go through school to achieve some credentials that would have mm. her have a leg up in her career and move her into the next level as far as employment and a salary and all this and and she told my manager that and my and and then actually my manager came and told me and we were both smiling I went to Casey I gave her a hug and I said I'm so excited for you and she was scared to death how I would have responded but since I said what I said, it actually pushed her over the edge to graduate on. And mm. I think, you know, that's the thing is creating a culture where people can grow and understanding that sometimes that's meaning not they're not going to grow inside your company or your business or your culture, but they grow and they graduate out. And so I think that's fantastic. She worked out her two weeks. We had her a little party at the end and she only worked for me for a year, but had done an amazing job. So it's an mm. interesting, it's an interesting time right now and how we motivate and keep people is interesting. I think one thing that I'm learning and we could talk about this further, it is a little more business oriented. I think as corporate um, has many different avenues of owning practices, John, in di different ways. We're not just talking about, you know, we're talking about all types of ownership here. To be mm -hmm. competitive in this market from a hiring standpoint, you better be looking at benefits. You better be, mm. I mean, it, there was a day where I said, there's no way we're offering health insurance. There's some of you maybe don't even offer 401k, right? But in a larger size town, I think we're seeing employees ask for these things. What type of benefits? Yeah, because there is so definitely. much corporate now kind of coming into the small business realm and owning practices and being able to offer right? Greater benefits yep. than a small it's a big business. Deal. It's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. And I think that's where that's when it's going to be interesting to see 
in the next, you know, five to 10 years in dentistry as, you know, at the same time you've got, you know, I don't know, we, we can't, we can't go too far down this rabbit hole, but I think right. that there's, you know, with new grads, there's a lot of changes as far as what they want um, and, and what they can do based mm-hmm. upon things like debt load and what the practice environment looks like. And, and then there's in, in our younger employees, there's a, there's a big change in what they're expecting and what they're willing to give up. And, uh, you know, the, it may be that the days of the 30 year employee mm. in our world may be gone. Yeah. Uh, it's a discussion for another day, but I think that there certainly are going to be changes that are going to force us, you know, as employers to think creatively, um, and, always to nurture whatever we have in our practices, like you say, to, to be the, the, to be the best they can be, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. And being open to the idea that, you know, if we believe that we believe in our people, then, you know, things will work out if we do the mm-hmm. right thing. I think that's mm-hmm. in the end, you know, do the right thing, do what you would want to do, how to act, you know, treat people the way you want to be treated. It does seem to work out. And, and you know, what's, what's interesting as we talk about, you know, this show today, in that mention of the transition time, you know, of, of kind of getting used to or getting into the groove of what's new, let's talk a little bit, Wes, about about what's been going on in, in your world because, you know, this episode is going to be a little bit about what an office building, what a real estate investment or office building mm. is all about in dentistry. What does it do for you? What does it look like uh, in terms of the thought process and the actual implementation execution of that? And I went through that now about uh, uh, almost 15 years ago, 10. Well, it's been about, I guess it's been, yeah, it's been 14 years ago. Mm. And uh, Wes, you just embarked on this journey in the last year. Mm. So talk a little bit about, you know, what your journey has been in terms of where were you in terms of like your thought process on in your practice mm. that compelled you to think about real estate and building and uh, uh, maybe just start there. You know, how did you get to the point where you realized it was time? So I guess really the, the decision comes at where you want to put, you know, the money, right? And this is considered to me, an investment for myself and my family first. Um, so because um, my dental business rents from um, my LLC that's owned by my family, right? So uh, it's not owned by my dental office. However, it was the dental office that allowed it to be purchased. It is an owner oc occupied situation. So I guess the original decision came from advice, right? Advice Uh from a financial planner, advice from friends that are on this podcast, right? (laughs) And um, really advice from, you know, other people in uh, the dental business. And um, it is an investment uh, that we made a decision to embark on, and it's about the right time, right? It's about the time where you, you know, it doesn't matter really per se, right, what size building you're going to build. Now, we can get into that because there is some parts of that that made me decide what size I built, but I would say whether you build for a single doc or a two doctor practice or a three doctor practice or whatever that might be, this is primarily Mm -hmm. an investment, right? This is an investment into basically the future, right? Hmm. And so this is a real estate investment. It has really nothing to do with anything but that, right? Now in the beginning, right? In the beginning, John, 20 years ago, right? This is my 20th year of practice, right? I graduated in 2003. In the beginning, this dream of building my own dental office, right, was this pie-in-the-sky thing that had a different meaning. 
And that meaning shifted probably about seven to eight years ago in from, hey, this pie in the sky to now this is an investment, right? Mm. It's not, yes, I want to build a really pretty dental office. Yes, I want to have a place that I call my own. But honestly, first and primarily, beyond any of that, right, this has became an investment to me. So that's where it really mm. started. That's a long answer um, to to this question. So I would first advise you, one, before you do anything like this, right, that you look at this as primarily an investment. Mm. Mm. So you felt looking at things, because I think, you know, we have obvious listeners that are in lots of different situations. You've got mm-hmm. people that are just starting out. And they're and they they have the dream of ownership, and they're trying to you know figure out how this works because you might got have gotten out of school with three or four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars of debt, mm-hmm. and you're looking at just simply purchasing a practice mm-hmm. at some point in your life, and the idea of a building uh, seems unattainable simply mm-hmm. because we look at big numbers, and because we don't have business training, we often as dentists don't understand the difference between good debt and bad debt. Mm. Um, and and there are lots of arguments about what good and bad debt means and what risks really uh, mean. But I think that you also may be in a point in your practice where you, know, you have either outgrown your space or want to expand, mm-hmm. or you might be in a situation where as many places in the country are experiencing, inflation has driven rent up to a point where it starts to be uh, significantly different than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. Mm. And I think much like making decisions on owning a home, uh, a home decision, I would say, you know, when it comes to renting versus buying, obviously we know that there's a, there's a part of this that is an investment, Mm -hmm. but I would say that from a home standpoint, I think all of us know that we can live lots of places. Mm-hmm. And decisions on your home are about choices and what you want. Mm-hmm. Now, a business has some of that mm-hmm. for sure. But a business is different because if you talk to anybody that's done this before, that's very that's done a lot of it before, I'm talking about building buildings and, and dental practice, they'll tell you that for every operatory that you add, and if you maximize the use of that operatory space, that there is a significant increase in potential production mm. and therefore a significant increase in the speed at which you return the investment that you make. So that means that you know buying a house that's a $2 million home definitely mm. increases your debt, but does not increase your income or potential income. Mm-hmm. But, but there is a real case to be made for a well-managed dental building and office space, if again, well-used, well-managed, to directly influence the potential income and even the future income that you may have going into ages where you're no longer even doing dentistry. So we're gonna come back to that at the end. We wanna talk about kind of what this looks like as far as future and financial Mm -hmm. planning a little bit, but let me ask you a little bit about the nitty gritty details, right? Because as everybody knows that dental guys, you know, we're into the details. So we have to pick and choose here, Wes, because building a building, I mean, there, you could talk to me, I know for an hour about countertops and carpet. Yeah. We're not going to talk about that. And we're not going to talk about that. Right. But I want you to talk to me a little bit about technology Mm. because I think that of all the things that people feel is a decision Mm -hmm. when they're building something, there's a decision about how much technology you integrate and how much technology you plan for. Mm. And some of these investments are things that you see a return on right away, but some of them may be down the road. What, it, what are the things that you that you made a decision to implement or integrate into your office right now with technology? What are some things you plan for? What are some equipment that you found was really worth it or, or maybe not worth it compared to where you were before? 
So the good news is, right, that the technology part of this was easy. Um, mm. Because in 2004, when I started from scratch, I was paperless. So I mm. started from scratch, paperless, never had paper charts. So I've always been used to, right, efficiency and technology upgrades, right, mm -hmm. and time those things very well. And uh, from a computer standpoint, um, this was a no-brainer, right? So if that's the technology you're talking about, right, the technology that I'm talking about is that, I mean, I have so many Ethernet drops, right, <laughs> in this, in this building that yep. I, I don't even know how many I have. Right. I mean, it's just, I have them everywhere. Right. And yes, we have some wireless connections in our office. You can't avoid that like scanners and things like that. But I'm, I have so many ethernet drops and I have so many data ports everywhere. Right. Mm -hmm. If there's a cabinet, there's a data port in it. If there's a mm. cabinet, there's an outlet in it because we use batteries in everything, right? Mm -hmm. If there's a place to run a cable, we've got conduit. If there's mm. the necessity for HDMI, you know, over a long run, we've got conduit. And these are things that you really honestly don't even really have to even... Like, they, they don't cost anything but planning, right? Yeah. So I would yep. say Very the, num inexpensive. the number one investment in technology is hiring a technology-driven mm -hmm. dental firm, okay? Yeah. And that, I'm not, I'm just saying, we've had, a, we've had a podcast years ago back in the original days of the dental guys called The Other right? Your other computer guy. Yeah, your company's guy. computer guy. Your company's yeah, yeah. computer guy, right? And John and I have hired local people. We've hired, you know, bigger local people. We've hired the guy off the street. In fact, John and I are so tech savvy, we've even done our own computer support, right? We've done it yeah. all. But That's I right. will say the number one thing as far as technology that helped me in my office is investing in, right, the people that know, right? And so, and I'll even say what my architect said. We've never had somebody be so thorough and do this so well as this company, right? Yeah. So I really appreciate it. And I think that that's, so, so what I'm hearing is that the technology really wasn't a difficult part because you had people that knew how to do that. And I know that you told me some things about that with your architect and you told me some things. So, so tell me what, what, di what were the challenges? Because I know some of them just from us talking, and I think it has a lot to do with the <laughs> okay. post-COVID construction situation. So, so what are some of the challenges that you face? What should people be kind of thinking about with Okay, this? so here's the biggest challenge with technology. Okay, now I moved 1,200 feet from my previous office. 1,200 feet. You, I mean, I would walk every day and take pictures of the office as it was being built. Okay. The problem that we ran into was that large internet service providers are not nimble. Mm. Large utility providers are not nimble in today's construction world. Hmm. We ran into issues with being able to have a timetable that was inside of 90 days predicting when our building would be done because there were things that were so just in time because of back orders. You might have something like an electrical panel show up that you've been asking for and you don't know when it's going to come and then all of a sudden the contractor calls you and says, we found a refurbished panel. We're ready to install it. Let's go. And then you're like, okay, that triggers this and that triggers this in a decision huh. tree. And immediately a phone call gets made to your ISP and which will happen with us. Hey, we're ready for that drop. There's power on the site now. 
Oh, okay, no problem. Click. Nobody does their job like you do the job, right? I mean, when I say that, nobody cares about your stuff more than mm -hmm. you, right? For sure. And so yeah. the number thing, number two thing that I would say is that the lead time on internet service providers in new construction in our area, regardless of who you went with, was more than 90 days. Was more mm. than 90 days. And so what happened was we moved and we did not have internet. And so we operated. I called mm. a buddy of mine. Mm. The, the week that we opened, we had no phones. We were operating on cell phone technology. Man. And I called a buddy of mine and I said, I have to have something. And he was yeah. like, I will have a 5G hotspot business grade in your office next week. And I was like, man, I, can he get it to me tomorrow? I mean, I'll go and drive hmm. a couple states over to get it, right? So yep, I bet people aren't as nimble as they once were. So I, I, we actually got one within a couple days and we had phones, we had internet and we were just creeping along, man. You don't realize how much stuff is cloud-based until you turn it off, right? Mm. You don't realize how much software cares about so, being connected. So how long did it take <laughs> before you had like just a hard line? Capable internet? Four months. Yeah. Four months. Oh my gosh. And this was I after. Mean, can you guys and we fired imagine? a company. We fired a company. So we wow. fired one company and then brought on another, and it still took 75 days, and that felt like that that was like breakneck speed for these people. And it I took mean, my office manager, right? And you're not in the sticks, right? You're 1,200 feet dude. from where you had had this for years. You've got healthcare facilities all around you. Yeah, right next it's to not hospital. in the middle of nowhere. You're right, exactly. You're, you're, you're like less than a, you're, you're a brisk walk of two minutes from a hospital. So I don't understand, except just to say again, as you're hearing this, just realize that, you know, when you're looking at projects like this, sometimes the things that your architect and your hired guns have no control over Zero. are the things that oftentimes will be the most frustrating. And certainly the same kind of thing that I remember dealing with, with the building I'm in when we were doing our build, you know, we had an excellent architect, dental specific. We had an excellent IT firm, dental specific. We had a contractor who figured it out, you know, wasn't familiar with building a million dental practice or dental offices, but it built a few and had worked with this architect. So there were some things there they had to learn, but I remember it being much more, much more about local municipalities, about, you know, the, the big corporate companies that you had to deal with for the utilities, uh, for engineering and making sure that, you know, just, just somebody from somewhere in the state had to come, you know, sign off on some small little thing that made the difference of occupancy or not. <laughs> yes. And I think that those are the things that, you know, keep you awake at night when you know you have a full schedule on Monday and you don't have an internet connection. And so I think that this is where, you know, our reliance on technology is awesome, but it's also, you know, when it comes down to it, I think Wes, what this, what this starts to make me think about is what many people don't truly understand uh, about real estate mm -hmm. and being your own landlord mm. is that there are, there's risk and there is hassle mm. factor. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of doctors that I know, for instance, that they're like, oh, I'm going to buy some rental property and manage it because, you know, you might have some capital lying around. You might have some money you want to invest. You might be one of those folks. that's like, I don't want to invest in the stock market for whatever reason. I want to invest in, all, you know, alternative investments. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, well, I'm going to do some rental properties. And um, I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but I'm saying that oftentimes you don't really understand that the person that's unclogging the toilet is no longer someone else. Mm -hmm. It's now you. The mm -hmm. person that's fixing the IT problem because there's not a cable connection to your building mm -hmm. is not 
the landlord. You're not, there's no, you don't have anybody to call but yourself. Mm. And, you know, this morning I had a, a, a light connection to the ceiling that just a set screw came loose on, for instance. Uh, uh, and so the light starts moving, like the post mount, li- or not post mount, but ceiling mount light is moving. And my assistants are freaking out. And, you know, again, I'm not renting this space. This is my space. This is my building. This is my situation. So I've got to go in there. I mean, I can call somebody and pay them, but they're not going to show up for days. And so you have to have the ability to feel comfortable with managing these types of problems. And they're not often problems, but you're going to have problems and you're going to have some significant challenges in the build. And then some significant challenges ongoing on things that you simply can't control. You know, we built, uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about this because it's going to segue right into talking about kind of the, the last part of the show, which is about buildings and how they how they affect your future. Um, you know, when, when we built our building, it was during uh, a bad time to build, quote unquote, right? That was, that was 08, 09, if you all remember that was when we had a kind of a, a real estate uh, cr- uh, elevation in price and then sort of went into a recession. So when we were making this build happen, it was when things were more expensive to build than they had been without us knowing that, right, for a while. And, you know, I'll just tell you, uh, because I'm on the back end of that, and, you know, Wes, you're, you're on the front end of that, I'm the back end of that, it doesn't make – a bit of difference. Now it might make a difference in some real estate areas. It might make a difference if you're building a hotel in Vegas and people stop coming to Vegas. You know, I, I don't know. There's obviously extreme examples of, you know, times when, when investments that you make, uh, don't end up working out, but you know, in the end you have to realize that no matter when you build, no matter how you build, if you choose to build, there are going to be things that you wish you knew. You know, and timing is beyond our control. And Wes, I know we've talked about this, that timing, obviously you saw the initial, I'm sure, estimate for the, what it was going to take to, to, to build this building mm. became very different just simply because of materials costs, mm-hmm. crazy time of inflation. Um, I'm sure there were times you were like, oh my gosh, you know, like, mm. what are we doing here? You're going to give me more bad news. But you just have to forge on, right? I mean, is that kind of the way you approached it? I mean, I'm sure you had some days. Yeah, I mean, there were days where you're like looking at <clears throat> the draws and you're thinking, okay, where are we at? Where are we at? Like, mm-hmm. I, and you're, there are days too, like you make decisions and those decisions have implications, right? That usually right. either save or cost. And in a building project, most of the time when you're making decisions during the building, right? They're changes, right? Mm-hmm. Or they're mistakes mm-hmm. or things that were missed. And it just cost more money. And so I would say that the number one thing that I would do to manage your build when you do it is to hire your own project manager. Meaning mm-hmm. like that person represents you. Now, listen, that is different than a project manager that works for the construction company. That is different mm. than a project man- manager that works for the architect. We're talking about your own. They are employed by you, usually a 1099, right? They are contracted by you, and they work for you off of a percentage, right? of the entire build cost. And there's all kinds of things you can do with the contract. If they help you save money, you can pay them a certain bonus, that type of thing. But I will say that the number one thing that I, that I did was I hired my own personal project manager, because if you're going to operate a dental business, right at the same time, you build a building and maintain a full book of patients and produce the type of dentistry that you want to produce. Unless you're just like chill 
and you're going to take a few days off every every week and not go after the deals and the and the nitpicky things and the and the things on the drawings that may get overlooked. Why do they have this many lights? What why are they putting all these sconces here? Why is this over here? Why are they doing this? And you we need to meet with the electrical contractor tonight because they said that there's some things that aren't right. Did we put enough outlets up there? And this is a person that one can save your rear end, and they saved mine. And I will say that the person that I hired was able to produce our product, our building, at less than 5% over budget. Now, when I tell people that in the midst of us building, right, they're like, no way. Because every time somebody would see me, they're like, man, you got to be over budget on this thing. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Not that far. I'm less than 5% over budget. And when we finished, we were less than 5% over budget. And you might say, well, you got to be under budget. Dude, it's always, it's always more. It's well, always more. Well, and especially in a time of inflation, yes, like what we've seen, it's unprecedented. You know, you can't control that, but you can control some things. But you have to have, I think, it's a great point. Having a third party that's, you know, employed by you, Right. rather than employed by the construction company, you know, rather than somebody that is the architect's own person. Let me you're say talking this about too. your own person. Unless, okay, so I'm blessed and I have construction experience. Like, let me tell you what my construction experience is. Okay, every single home that my father has lived in, he built and I was right by his side, Right. And John, you've seen the the stuff that he oh, yeah. does. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? I mean, yep. the guy's an engineer. He owned an engineering firm, and he also is an amazing craftsman. On top of that, he can build anything, right? And I've been around his side since I was born, okay? So I have the knowledge. I worked for a, a development firm when I was in college. I did design work in CAD. I did takeoffs, which is basically estimates, how many things mm-hmm. you were going to need and how much that would cost to save a company money that was building track homes, custom track homes. Very, very nice. And so all of that experience helped me, right? Mm-hmm. All of that knowledge helped me. Now, take that knowledge away, right? Mm-hmm. And even my contractor said this, who has built many dental offices. He said, Wes, you had some knowledge here that really helped us perform better, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and we were able to do things in a more timely fashion because you could communicate things to us that took the dental idea and made it into a construction idea. And so Mm -hmm. unless you have that knowledge that I just described, then you need to hire someone that has that knowledge, right? Right. And maybe that's your project manager, but do they have dental knowledge? See, I'm marrying dental with construction and estimation. Well, and I think the contrast to this, for those who are maybe looking at this, is you can hire a supply company Mm. to do your design and build. Mm -hmm. And so as a contrast to having an architect and having a project manager and having somebody who can translate the dental knowledge into construction knowledge. You could also go to a company that supplies all of your supplies. Mm -hmm. They will sell you uh, a plan. Really, they won't. They'll give it to you for free, quote unquote. That's right. And all their design services will be, quote, free. Yes. And... You basically say, we're going to let this company, this this supply company, we're going to let them be in charge of building. building. It will be built, absolutely. They will show up. They will make sure. Why? Because what's happening is that there is a tremendous amount of money to be made in the sale of supplies, especially of the big supplies and equipment, things that you could make on your own. They have ways of, of, you know, they have options that are, you know, quote, ready built, ready to go, um, that don't involve as much custom design 
they're more, hey, here's, we will give you two or three options and we will bring in mm-hmm. our pre-made things that we know work. Mm-hmm. And that does not mean that that is bad. Right. What that means is that's just a different approach. It allows you as a dentist to be able to sit back and allow a company to deal with problems because they are essentially being paid through the sale of their equipment right. to you. And so it's almost like having a rep for a company getting paid. So therefore you don't have to worry about making sure you have the right products show up because they're getting paid to give you the right products because they're selling them to you. And companies will obviously do a design and build. But as both of us have experienced having done this in a very similar way, um, there, in my opinion and Wes's opinion, I know I can speak for you that there's no comparison for what you get for your money to being able to have a custom design from a standpoint of things like IT and cabinetry mm. and the look and feel of surfaces and mm. finishes and the workflow and the lighting and the sound control and the infrastructure for building into the future um, for what you could spend in a wall unit from a major dental supplier you could outfit probably four or five rooms full of custom cabinetry. And if you do just a little bit of a deep dive on this, you'll find that for the convenience Mm -hmm. of you not having to do all of this thinking, okay, there is a cost. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't even necessarily mean you get a better product for that cost. Mm -hmm. It's just that you get less things you potentially have to quote, think about. So, I think as a conclusion, a little bit of a conclusion of Wes, I think we're going to need to come back to this whole discussion to really flesh out a little bit more, depending on what our listeners want to hear about. If they want to hear more about this, I think they do, because I think that there's a turning point happening right now as we're trying to think about what we're going to be thinking long term about dental practice, where buildings become a very important part of that. And so let's talk about as we as we kind of come into the, you know, the soft landing here of the show thinking about what this all means. Let's talk about the future. And Wes, you know, you know, I'm a numbers guy. And and when I make decisions, uh, I always try to think about what it's going to mean for the future. And, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about buildings as a vehicle for Mm. wealth building and for the future. Mm. Because in the end, why do you build a building? Well, you build it maybe because of some things you want that you can't get, okay, Mm -hmm. like space or, you know, nicer equipment or better IT uh, infrastructure or a better workflow or to get out of a strip mall or whatever it might be. But you might be doing that and kind of for the wrong reasons. You know, I think that one of the things I've certainly learned over the years is that the biggest idea behind building real estate ownership is wealth over the long term and building the ability to have a financial future. And Wes, I'll never forget, you know, years ago talking about, you know, mailbox money with you, right? The idea that, you know, if you own something that maybe one day a check just shows up in your mailbox once a month with a rent payment from mm-hmm. someone else paying you for simply the uh, the right to use the space that you own. Mm. So I want to talk about some numbers quickly for our, for our listeners who maybe are, are mm. everybody that's an owner obviously is very familiar with what they're paying in rent. Mm-hmm. So I just want you to think about what you're paying in rent right now. Okay. So you kind of have that number in your mind and you kind of know about a little bit about the square footage. Probably you have an idea of the square footage you currently own or you currently rent. I'm sorry. So let's talk about some numbers. When you build a building, and these are just numbers that are like hardwired into my brain. So it's not that I, I'm like a super nerd all the time about every single thing, but this is one thing I'm a nerd no, about. No, this is this is this is right up your alley, and this is perfect. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. when you so, when you're listening so for, to this, yeah, make make, make the point because I think it's a good point. Yeah, you should get your sharp sharpen your pencils. Yeah. Sharpen your pencils, stop, stop boys and the girls. Car. Stop the car. Yeah. And turn off the lawn more. Okay. <laughs> turn it off. Get your pencil out. Or for those it's of you, those you know, own a own a those of, those of you who own a Galaxy Note, you know, pull out your stylus like Wes Mullen. That's me. And I know, I know. 
So for every million dollars, okay, for every million dollars in building that you build, let's estimate an interest rate of 6% because that's about where we are right now. It might be a little lower, it might be a little higher, but let's just say 6% is about right. I've always used 5 to 6% as a good estimate. So if you have a 15 year note, okay, if you have to pay back your loan within 15 years, and we can talk more about, there's obviously lots of options on how to pay it back. You don't necessarily have to pay it back in 15, but let's just use 15 years. So at 6% every million dollars, you're somewhere between eight and $9,000 a month that you're gonna have to pay in order to make that work. So what does that look like for you? Well, depending on where you are and what a million dollars gets you, Let's say a million dollars gets you a four or five operatory building, you know, and maybe it's 2,000, 2,500 square feet, pretty reasonable amount of square footage for that amount of operatory space. Without the equipment. Right. Without the equipment. That's correct. We're just talking about the build out. So that's, let's say that's a million dollars. We're just going to use that as a round number. You know, you're roughly going to be in the $8,500 a month payment in order Mm -hmm. to pay that off over 15 years at 6% interest. So compare that to what you're paying in rent. And at first glance, it might be higher. Depends on which city you're in. I've talked to lots of people that are, you know, right at that level for uh, for rent of, you know, $8,000 and $10,000 a month. It's not uncommon for 2,500 square feet to be $20 or more per square foot. So, you know, uh, you might be in a situation where it's $40 a square foot. You know, Mm -hmm. it just depends on where you're at. So, at first glance, you might think, well, okay, that's more than what my rent is. And it may be. Now, there's ways to work around that. There's ways to structure the loan to where you can have a longer time to pay that off. Or just the way that you amortize the loan. You could have a 30-year amortization with you know, a, a lower payment, but then you have a balloon payment at the end in a few years where, in other words, you have to refinance the loan at some point so the bank takes less risk. Mm-hmm. So there's ways to lower those payments even more. The bottom line is, let's say you can pay this debt off in 15 to 20 years. And you think about your age and you think, okay, if I'm 50 years old, just as a number, and you think by the time I retire, hopefully I've got this paid off or close to it. What does that look like over your life? What does that look like in terms of income over the years that maybe you retire, but someone else is paying that rent. And you can start to do the math and think, you know, if that same person's paying you back that whatever it is, $8,000, $10,000 a month after it's paid off, that's a significant potential amount of your income that is simply showing up in the mailbox. And then you've got the potential of being able to turn around and sell that asset. At some point, if you want to sell that building, there's a significant amount of growth and appreciation. We know that dental office buildings are very, they're worth a lot. They're very valuable real estate because it's so specialized. And of course, obviously lots of variables, lots of variables. Depends on what city you're in and the size of the building. And I think we can all, uh, you know, we see now, Wes, as we've talked a lot about this over the last few years, that there's a reason why a lot of DSOs and corporate dentistry look at a two doctor practice or more and they see that as being the most valuable. Mm. And they see that as being the most valuable because of the efficiency of the space mm-hmm. and the economies of scale. In other words, if you have two doctors, it's kind of a good sweet spot, potentially as far as lowering the cost of supplies without running into management nightmares of having you know a 10 doctor practice all in one building. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking about what what does this mean for me? Maybe it's even more than your rent might be but I want you to think about the increased potential in what you could produce. And uh, I also want you to think about what the future looks like as far as return on investment. And when does this become something that changes your whole kind of trajectory when it comes to building wealth in the long run? And it's not even about the wealth. That's all. Oftentimes I think people are silly when they just think about the wealth side of it, but it's just about having more freedom Mm -hmm. down the road it's not so much wealth as it is freedom it's the fact that it's not so much that you can ride off into the sunset but it's the fact that you have the ability to do so when you want versus someone else telling you when you have to and i think that that's something that's important i think that it's something that 
you have to have some of these numbers in mind when you're thinking about it. You've got to run the numbers. I think you owe it to yourself if you're renting right now. It's not necessarily that you have to build, but you owe it to yourself to look at it and run some numbers out there and look at what it looks like in the long run. And it's very interesting. And obviously, Wes, you and I can't have a huge effect on how people view debt, but I've seen such a huge change. This is just my personal soapbox on this, but I've seen such a huge change in debt aversion with younger generations. Some of it is what happened. They got totally screwed over many times by the recession. Right. They came out, you know, thinking they would have a job making a hundred thousand and they were only making 50 or whatever it might be. So I get why they're a little gun shy, but there's good debt and there's bad debt. We kind of started the show with this. Mm -hmm. And if we don't, invest and create wealth through good debt, someone else is going to. Someone else is going to, because there's not going to be a decrease in demand for dental services. Despite what you may have heard, that's never going to happen. People still need what we provide. The only question is on this side of things is, will you be the one that leverages that need into wealth through good debt or will someone else use good debt mm -hmm. to leverage that need and be the ones that win in the long run the people that are doing the best that i've ever seen if anybody i've ever known in dentistry are people that have leveraged real estate and have used that as a way to take advantage of the fact that people are so worried about debt that they, that they can't see the future. They're blinded by that fear. And there's ways to mitigate that fear, but we have to start by running the numbers, seeing if it makes sense, talking to people that are very comfortable. You know, it's funny, I'll just, I'll stop talking in a second, I promise, but. <laughs> it's all good. When you talk to people that are really into real estate, like I'm talking about legit people, because there's a lot of BS about it. Yes. There's a lot of people that think they know about real estate. Be very careful. They, you know, they became a, yeah, they became a realtor last year, you know, when, and I'm going to tell you about real estate. But if you start to talk about really, really wealthy real estate developers, people that really know what they're talking about, they'll just talk to you about how money is funny to, to like different people. They think that, that, that a certain amount of money is too much or crazy or whatever. And it's just because you're not in that world. You know, you're not in the world uh, where these people are talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm hmm you know, for one investment, you know, whereas we're looking at this going, oh my gosh, you know, a million dollars, that sounds like a lot of money. And that's because a lot of us never grew up with those kinds of numbers. We were never around those kinds of numbers. And when we went to dental school, we became nervous about money because we never really got any education about, about what it looks like. And you know that if you really start to go out and talk to a lot of dentists who are getting close to retirement age, you know that Many of them saved very little and they had very little education is why they didn't save. They didn't know. And so it's up to us, I think, if we want to see private practice continue to be a thing or if we want to see dentistry continue to grow from a standpoint of wealth building, we have to be willing to say, hey, you know, this is an opportunity where we can use our, it's kind of the difference, Wes, and this goes back way back to the the difference between practice and business yep. and whether you can, whether you're running a dental practice, or you're running a dental business, 51% business and 49% healthcare people. <laughs> How many it times have we said back this? to, it goes back to literally the first, you know, 10 episodes of the dental guys back years and years ago, years ago, you know, you, you have to have, you have to want always to do the best for your patient. All this nerd stuff we talk about with, dental research and this is all critically important critically Notice too important. like We're over the talking. years we've never talked about buying and cheaping out right no and and no, we're not, we're not, and we're not even like chasing the shiny new thing right yeah we may have mm -hmm. done some of that some of that but it's very calculated very calculated mm -hmm. there have been some mistakes made right but in the quest for fantastic dentistry, business can be maintained, and it can mm. be very, very um, lucrative in a good way.
for the patient's uh-huh. benefit, right, and your benefit too, to pursue great dentistry at the same time, making yes. an amazing, amazing income. Now, here's the here's the kicker. Somebody told me this years ago. They said the greatest thing you can do is leverage your profession, and I didn't know what he was saying 20 years ago, mm. but now I can say. I know what he's saying. Leverage your profession for your life, right? Mm-hmm. For your business, right? Right. Because you will investment. get to a point if you choose to do that. Well, I'll just say it this way. Have you ever known a dentist to invest in something that they know nothing about? Oh, my God. It happens all the time. Yeah. All the time. You know, somebody gets some harebrained idea to invest in a burger joint or uh, a wine tasting room because they like wine, a burger joint because they like a burger or they have this, just this idea, right. Of doing, and I'm not saying it never works, but we know our business. We know what it takes to be excellent at our business. You know, dentistry, you know what it takes to be good at dentistry. You know what it feels like when dentistry is done well. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like for you? Taking ideas from other businesses, absolutely. But first and foremost, you almost will never, you almost never will make more money doing anything else than doing dentistry. So, so use that idea and leverage that idea and make yourself be able to just simply be happier as you come into work. That's really what it ends up being in the end, you know? So I think this is where, we have still a lot to learn in our profession. Mm-hmm. And I think it's where we have to keep keep kind of doing running the numbers, finding people smarter than us too, that can help us make these decisions. It's, it, hey, you it's, didn't ask it's, me the, it's the, worth the final the question, though, right? The final question, right, is would I do it again? Well, yeah. John, would you build your building again? Ten times, man. Ten times. 10 times I'd build this building again and I would do it the same way. And, yeah. you know, no regrets, right? Sure, there's yeah, little things here and there, right? I mean, I could nitpick the heck out of anything, right? Of course. My class two of composites, course. I nitpick them. Why can't I nitpick my building, right? right? But I'll be honest with you. I would do it again 10 times over, 10 times. And in fact, it was an enjoyable process. It was stressful, but it was enjoyable. And in the end, Mm -hmm. I have something that I've built for an investment and efficiency and profitability, right? And so these are things that you probably don't hear Wes, the dental guy, talking about much because really we are a clinical-based podcast, John, and that's what we love to talk about. And I I love talking about bioblasters, aluminum oxide, I like talking about what micron sizes you use so you don't inhale this crap into people's noses. I like talking about what the greatest clinical trends are in dentistry today. What are we changing today, man? Because that's what's coming this year on the Dental Guys podcast is like the clinical trends in dentistry. Oh my goodness. I was talking today to Brad, the dental lab guy. He wants to meet up with Mark Ludlow and really crack the code on full arch digital scanning for our hybrid restorations. He's talking about new materials and things like that. Yeah, this is the passion behind the business, yep. right? This is the passion, John. That's right. That's and so what drives listen, it. this is what drives it. And here, listen, if you're listening to this right now and you know somebody that needs to hear it, hey, share the love, right? Like us on Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff. And you know what? You can find us on your great podcast catchers, whatever you want to use, Spotify, Apple, iTunes, or even on YouTube. So, John, it's been another great podcast, and I really did enjoy building my building. I enjoyed talking about it. If you want to hear more about the building, the operatory design, how I laid that all out, those are the nitty-gritty things that really maybe some of you want to geek out about, and we can talk about it. We can talk about the equipment that I purchased and why I purchased what brands and all that kind of stuff. We don't care because it was amazing. I can tell you about some mistakes. So until we get to that, it's been another great podcast, John. And for John, I'm Wes, and we are the Dental Guys. (laughs) 